Let's do some past med questions. A 41 year old man presents to a clinic due to ongoing poorly controlled hypertension. He was originally diagnosed at a routine appointment and has a family history of hypertension at a young age. He is currently on the following drug therapy lisinophil 80 MGOD, nifedipine modified release 40 MGPD. So he's on AC inhibitor and calcium channel blocker. His clinic blood pressure today is 154 over 93, still high. Blood tests ordered previously show sodium is normal, potassium is low. Bicarbonate is high, urea is normal, creatinine is normal. A ultrasound KUB previously performed for renal stones showed normal anatomy. What's the most appropriate next management step? So potassium is low. So you want to give a potassium sparing diuretic, right? Potassium sparing diuretic block sodium. Absorption blocks potassium excretion, so it should retain potassium. Hmm. Ask the patient to monitor blood pressure at home and reattend clinic with BP diary. Yep, I think that's the correct thing to do because uh, you might have white coat hypertension. So a BPM or HBPM is ideal to make sure this is really hypertension. Measure blood, uh, measure plasma aldosterone renin ratio. Uh, you're looking for secondary causes of hypertension, huh? Has a family history of hypertension at a young age. Yeah, possible, possible. Mm. Perform a renal artery Doppler previous previous. Yeah, yeah, wait, renal artery Doppler suspecting renal artery stenosis. Uh. Should be okay since, since he's on lisinopril and then renal function is okay. Uh, what is bicarb bicarbonate high though? Perform thyroid function tests. Why? There's no signs of hyperthyroid or hypothyroid. Add indapamide to therapy. Indapamide is a thiazide diuretic. A thiazide diuretic can cause wait can cause further hypokalemia, so shouldn't do that. Then confirm whether this is really hypertension or not first. Lah. Okay. Oh, the answer is to measure plasma aldosterone renin ratio. Why? Ah? Oh yeah, okay. Because of the low potassium, right? Alright. Okay, be more vigilant next time. Low potassium. Think of secondary cause, which is cons or adrenal hyperplasia. Okay, plasma aldosterone renin ratio is the first line investigation in suspected primary hyperaldosteronism. It is often difficult to discern between primary hypertension and secondary hypertension, yet clues such as persistently high or malignant blood pressure, labile blood pressure measurements, young age, and electrolyte abnormalities provide clues to a possible secondary etiology. In this scenario, transient resistant hypertension is accompanied by modest hypokalemia and raised bicarbonate. This electrolyte picture is suggestive of primary hyperaldosteronism. Why but primary hyper hyperaldosteronism cause raised bicarbonate though? Function of the kidney is to secrete bicarbonate. Oh, aldosterone causes Bicarbonate reabsorption, is it? Let's look at the osmosis video. I think they show the function of aldosterone in your kidneys.
will pump out hydrogen and pump in bicarbonate. That's a function of aldosterone on your alpha intercalated cells. So reabsorb bicarbonate. That's why, yes, high bicarbonates. High bicarbonate, low sodium, suspect primary hyperaldosteronism. In this scenario, treatment resistant hypertension is accompanied by modest hypokalemia and raised bicarbonate. This electrolyte picture is suggestive of primary hyperaldosteronism, where excess aldosterone secretion leads to increased sodium reabsorption whilst favoring potassium secretion in the urine. It is important to note, however, that primary hyperaldosteronism can also exclusively present with severe treatment resistant hypertension and no electrolyte abnormalities. The first line investigation is suspect that primary hyperaldosterone in suspected primary hyperaldosteronism is plasma aldosterone renin ratio. Confirmation of the diagnosis is given by an elevated ratio, suggestive of aldosterone raised and appropriately in comparison to normal or low circulating renin. Asking the patient to monitor blood pressure at home is important, however, would not solve his hypertension and the electrolyte abnormalities. A renal artery doppler could elucidate the presence of renal artery stenosis. <laughs> Excuse me. A common cause of secondary hypertension. In this scenario, previous normal imaging and preserved renal function in view of therapy with ACE inhibitor makes uh, renal, uh, renal artery stenosis a less likely diagnosis. Mm, renal function, preserved renal function with ACE inhibitor, yeah. Hypertension may be associated with hypothyroidism, hence um, hypertension associated with hypothyroidism. Oh, okay. Hence, requesting thyroid function test would be incorrect. Huh? Hypertension may be associated with hypothyroidism, hence requesting thyroid function test would be incorrect. Why? Can that test for hypothyroidism by doing thyroid function test? What? However, this is unlikely would be correct or incorrect. However, this is unlikely given the lack of other symptoms and signs of hypothyroidism and not the most appropriate management of this presentation. Nice guidelines recommend a thiazide like directed like a, as a third line antihypertensive. However, prescribing indapamide would be incorrect in this scenario. Indeed, this drug would likely worsen the pre existing hypokalemia, exposing the person to arrhythmia risk. Moreover, this fails to address the underlying cause of the hypertension. Okay, so some notes on primary hyperaldosteronism. Primary hyperaldosteronism was previously thought to be most commonly caused by an adrenal adenoma termed Korn syndrome. However, recent studies have shown that bilateral idiopathic adrenal hyperplasia is the cause in up to 70% of cases. Differentiating between the two is important as this determines treatment. Adrenal carcinoma is an extremely rare cause of primary hyperaldosteronism. Features include hypertension, hypokalemia, for example, muscle weakness. This is classically, uh, this is a classical feature in exams, but studies suggest this is seen in only uh, 10 to 40% of patients. Alkalosis. Investigations, the 2016 Endocrine Society recommended that plasma aldosterone renin ratio is the first line investigation in suspected primary hyperaldosteronism. Should show high aldosterone levels alongside low renin levels, negative feedback due to sodium retention from aldosterone. Following this, a high resolution CT abdomen and adrenal vein sampling is used to differentiate between unilateral and bilateral sources of aldosterone excess. If the CT is normal, adrenal vein sampling can be used to distinguish between unilateral adenoma and bilateral hyperplasia. Management adrenal adenoma surgery, bilateral adrenal cortical, uh, adrenal cortical hyperplasia, aldosterone antagonist, for example, spironolactone. CT abdomen showing a right sided adenoma in a patient who presented with hypertension and hypokalemia. The adenoma is seen next to or below the liver. 
Next question. A 30-year-old woman is admitted to the emergency department following a suspected peanut allergy. On examination, she has gross facial and tongue edema. Essential edema. Her oxygen saturations are 97 on room air. Still okay. Pulse is 96 per minute on the higher end of normal. And blood pressure 90 out of 62. That's not good. It's going into shock. The paramedics have already gained intravenous access. What's the most appropriate way to give adrenaline in this situation? I am. No matter what, I am better way. Intramuscular. Because IV, once you get the dose wrong, you can kill somebody. The resuscitation council guidelines only recommend giving adrenaline intramuscularly, regardless of whether the patient has intravenous access or not. Okay, and that's that. No arguing that. Next question. A 54-year-old female presents one week following a hip replacement with profuse diarrhea. What is the most likely diagnosis? Hmm. He had a, she had a hip replacement one week ago. And now she has profuse diarrhea. Maybe after a hip replacement, she was given antibiotics. Antibiotics. Um, especially, I think... Macrolides can cause um, proliferation of Clostridium difficile, maybe. Let's see. Yes, that's what they are implying. Clostridium difficile is the most likely cause as this patient would have been given broad-spectrum antibiotics in the time of operation. I recommend that the following patients are given antibiotics to prevent surgical site infections. Clean surgery involving the placement of a prosthesis of one or implant, clean contaminated surgery, con contaminated surgery, surgery on a dirty or infected wound requires antibiotic treatment in addition to prophylaxis. So some notes on Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile is a gram-positive rod often encountered in hospital practice. It produces an exotoxin which causes intestinal damage leading to a syndrome called pseudomembranous colitis. Clostridium difficile develops when the normal gut flora are suppressed by broad-spectrum antibiotics. Clindamycin is historically uh, associated with causing Clostridium difficile, but the etiology have evolved significantly over the past 10 years. Second and third generation cephalosporins are now the leading cause. Okay, not, not macrolides, but cephalosporins. Second and third generation cephalosporins are now the leading cause of Clostridium difficile. Other than uh, antibiotics risk factors include proton pump inhibitors um, features include diarrhea abdominal pain raised white blood cell count is characteristic if severe toxic me megacolon if, if severe toxic megacolon may develop the public health england severity scale is often used as this may determine treatment mild normal white blood cell moderate raised white blood cell more than less than 15 typically three to five loose stools per day severe white blood cell more than 15 or an acutely increased creatinine more than 50 percent above baseline or a temperature more than 38.5 or evidence of severe colitis abdominal radiological signs life-threatening hypotension partial complete ileus toxic megacolon or cd evidence of severe disease diagnosis is made by detecting c diff toxin in the stool clostridium and field and difficile antigen positively on positivity only shows exposure to the bacteria rather than current infection So CDT, C diff toxin in the stool. Antigen only shows exposure rather than current infection. Management first line therapy is oral metronidazole for 10 to 14 days. If severe or not responding to metronidazole, then oral vancomycin may be used. Recurrent infection occurs in 20% of patients, increasing to 50% after the second episode. Mm. Fidasomycin Fido, may also be used for patients who are not responding, particularly those with multiple comorbidities. If life-threatening infections, a combination of oral vancomycin and intravenous metronidazole should be used. Oral vancomycin, huh? No, that is oral. Strange, very strange. Life-threatening, how can they take orally if they're not conscious? They are vomiting. Other therapies, Bezlotosumab is a monoclonal antibody which targets Clostridium difficile toxin B. It's not in widespread use. Okay, next question. 
a 55 year old man has been admitted to the respiratory ward and is being treated for a pneumonia. He is currently receiving co amoxiclav treatment. He also takes losartan for hypertension and metformin for type 2 diabetes, which are both well controlled normally. The nurse asked for, patient, for the patient to be urgently reviewed as recent observations reveal his heart rate to be 130 beats per minute and his blood pressure dropped to 90 over 60. What's going on? The nurse also notes that his urine output has been decreasing and he's only produced 10 ml of urine over the past hour. So that's AKI. Fluid resuscitation is initiated and the blood test revealed the following results. Resuscitation is initiated and blood test revealed the following results. Wait, before looking at the results, clinically, what does this look like? He's on the respiratory ward. He had a pneumonia. He is receiving core moxiclav. Takes losartan for hypertension metformin for T2DM. No control. Urgently review recent observation. Tachycardia and hypotension. What's going on? What's causing the AKI? Is it a coamoxiclav? Does that cause AKI? Amoxicillin clavernic acid. I don't know that it causes AKI. Urea is high, creatinine is high. Definitely there's some renal impairment here. What's the most important appropriate action regarding his medication? Oh, okay. He's on metformin, isn't he? So you have to stop the metformin. Right? Wait. What? Well controlled normally. Hypertension. Losartan. Metformin. Continue metformin. Why continue? It's having AKI. So you have to stop metformin. Start gentamicin. Um, what's gentamicin for? It's another antibiotic. Stop losartan. Uh, probably you want to stop losartan as well. Losartan is a angiotensin receptor blocker. Mm. In AKI, do you stop ARBs? You will stop any diuretics. Losartan is a diuretic, right? No, is it? Uh, it's a uh... yeah, it is a diuretic. This inhibitor is a diuretic, also. Losartan is a diuretic, so you need to stop losartan. No need to give amlodipine, uh, blood pressure already low. Stop losartan for another pill, blood pressure already low, so I have to give another antihypertensive for now. Acute situation. Stop loss at time. You should stop the back for me, also, but uh, option is not here. So, the answer is stop loss at Angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist should be stopped in AKI as it may worsen renal function. The patient is experiencing acute kidney injury. The cause is pre renal due to sepsis, resulting in hypotension and renal hypoperfusion. Loss at is an angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist and so should be stopped in AKI as it may worsen renal function. Therefore, stopping losartan is the correct answer. ARB, angiotensin to receptor antagonist. So, it sort of stops sodium reabsorption. Hmm. Metformin can accumulate in renal impairment and cause like the acidosis. Metformin should be stopped in AKI and not continued. Gentamicin is a nephrotoxic antibiotic and can cause acute tubular necrosis. Therefore, in AKI, it should be avoided or used with caution if necessary. As this patient is currently hypotensive, swapping losartan for another antihypertensive such as enlodipine will not improve the hypotension or the poor renal function. Another pill is AIDS inhibitor and may also worsen renal function in AKI. Swapping losartan for another pill would provide no benefit. Wait, what's the threshold urine production for AKI? Do you have it in the notes here?
Hmm, not in the notes here. What nice guidelines? Guidelines. AKI. Overview. We have three charts. Do you have any summary tables? No summary tables. Let's go to interactive flow charts, AKI. And risk assessment identification thing here, identification. Detection. A rise in serum creatinine of 26 micromoles per liter or greater within 48 hours. Yes. Detect AKI in line with the P rifle risk, injury, failure, and loss, and end stage renal disease. P refers to pediatric classification. P rifle akin, that's for acute kidney injury network, or KDGO definitions. KDGO is kidney disease improving global outcomes definitions. By using uh, any of the following criteria, rise in serum creatinine of 26 micromoles per liter or greater within 48 hours, a 50% or greater rise in serum creatinine known to presume known or presumed to have occurred within the past seven days, a fall in urine output to less than 0 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than six hours in adults and more than eight hours in children and young people. A 25% or greater fall in EGFR. So 0 0.5 ml per kg per hour. This guy has uh, 10 ml. So 0 0.5 ml per kg per hour. He's 55 years old. We estimate 70 kg. 0 0.5 times 70. Uh, 35 ml should be at least 35 ml for the past hour. So 10 ml is very little, but it has to be at least 6 hours, so that's a threshold. Okay. Right, next question. A 33-year-old woman who is 34 weeks pregnant with twins presents to you with a 3-day history of intense pruritus which has been affecting her sleep. You can see multiple excoriations but no obvious skin rash. Other than this, the pregnancy has been going well and fetal movements are normal. Bloods are taken. Bilirubin is high. ALP is high. ALT is high. What's going on? An abdominal ultrasound was normal. Based on a likely diagnosis, what's the most likely management plan? What is this diagnosis? Huh? Cholestatic disease of pregnancy, is it? ALP is a cholestatic disease, but bilirubin is a the conjugated kind of bilirubin, I guess. Um, so how do you manage cholestatic disease of pregnancy? Uh, so bilirubin is high, might be dangerous for the child, I'm guessing. Not sure of the correct management is 34 weeks um she will likely need c-section of a reaction chlorphenamine chlorphenamine is an antihistamine is it safe to use in pregnancy don't remember and for immediate delivery 34 weeks is it dangerous plan to induce labor hmm. let's just try ctg monitoring see how's the baby first nope the answer is plan to induce labor at 37 weeks okay so this is intrahepatic cholestasis, cholestasis of pregnancy Intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy increases the risk of stillbirth. Therefore, induction of labor is generally offered at 
37 to 38 week gestation. This woman has intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. It's characterized by abnormal LFTs and intense pruritis, usually in the third trimester. The important thing to remember is that there are increased risks associated with this condition, including fetal distress and intrauterine death and maternal morbidity. This risk goes up after 37 weeks gestation and therefore induction of labor should be considered at this point. This is more likely to be the case in women with higher levels of transaminases and bile acids such as in this patient. Multiple pregnancy is a risk factor. Although increased fetal surveillance is recommended, she would although increased fetal surveillance is recommended, she would not need to be admitted as at this stage unless there was evidence of immediate concern Evidence of immediate concern for the fetus. Although increased fetal surveillance recommended, she will not need to be admitted at this stage unless there was evidence of immediate concern for the fetus. In this question, there is no evidence that a cesarean section is necessary. Usually, in this condition, a vaginal birth is suitable. Cesarean section is rarely needed. However, according to BMJ, best practice is sometimes necessary for those with non-reassuring fetal status, which is not the case here. Although antihistamines can be used for symptomatic relief in this condition, reassurance and antihistamines would not be enough on its own because of the risk involved with this condition. Uh, the options for symptom relief include ursodeoxycholic acid, cholestyramine, and topical emollients. There is nothing in this scenario to imply immediate delivery is required. The fetal movements are normal and the ultrasound was normal. Oh, it was already done, is it? I didn't read properly, yeah. Fetal movements are normal. Other than this, the pregnancy has been going well and fetal movements are normal. Hmm. Okay. Intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Some notes on it. Intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, also known as obstetric cholestasis, uh, affects around 1% of pregnancy. 1% of pregnancy is in the UK. It's associated with an increased risk of premature birth. Features include pruritus may be intense, typically worse on the palms, soles, and abdomen. Clinically detectable jaundice occurs in around 20% of patients. Clinically detectable jaundice. Okay. Uh, and raised bilirubin is in more than 90% of cases. Management. Induction of labor at 37 to 38 weeks is common practice but may not be evidence based. Also, the oxycholic acid, again, widely used but evidence based is not clear, clear. Vitamin K supplementation. Uh, okay. Recurrence of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is 45 to 90% subsequent pregnancy. Quite high. Um, what else do I want to see? Oh, chlorphenamine, chlorphenamine is it? Chlorphenamine. Uh, look at how safe is it in pregnancy. Periton. Pregnancy. There are no adequate data from the use for the from the use of chlorphenamine melanate in melanate in pregnant women. The potential risk for humans is unknown. Use during the third trimester may result in reactions in the newborn or premature neonates. Not to be used during pregnancy unless considered essential by a physician. So nope. And then lactation, chlorphenamine melanate and other inhibitors antihistamine may inhibit lactation and may be secreted in breast milk not to be used during lactation unless considered essential by a physician. Okay, so better not to use chlorphenamine in pregnancy or breastfeeding if you don't really have to. Just 100 each. And use others like deoxycholic acid, or so deoxycholic acid or cholestyramine, right? Or so the oxycholic acid cholestyramine. Let's look at the safety profile of these two drugs in pregnancy. Cholestyramine. Uh, cholestyramine. Cholestyramine. Indication. 
coronary heart disease, reduction of plasma cholesterol, relief of pruritus, relief of diarrhea associated with ideal resection, management of radiation induced diarrhea. The bile acid sequestrant, cholesteramine resins absorb and combine with the bile acids in the intestine to form an insoluble complex which is excreted in the feces. This results in a continuous half partial removal. Continuous T H O U G H tough, right? Tough partial removal of bile acids from the enterohepatic circulation by preventing their reabsorption. The increased fecal loss of bile acids leads to an increased oxidation of cholesterol to bile acids and a decrease in serum cholesterol levels and low density lipoprotein serum levels. Cholesteramine is hydrophilic but is not soluble in water. Hydrophilic but not soluble in water. Strange, huh? Lacks water but not soluble in water. Nor is it hydrolyzed by digestive enzymes. Nor is it hydrolyzed by digestive enzymes. Okay. In patients with partial biliary obstruction, the reduction of serum bile acid levels reduces excess bile acids deposited in dermal tissue. Okay. How about the pregnancy? Safety of cholesterol in pregnancy and lactation has not been established and the possibility of interference or absorption of fat soluble vitamins should be considered. Hmm. Okay, I guess. Uh, not everything is 100% safe. Pregnancy. This doesn't sound like a very serious thing. I give vitamin K, ADK. Okay, and then the other one was Urso. Also, the oxycholic acid. Also, the oxycholic acid indication PBC, pediatric population, hepatobiliary disorders. It is a bile acid preparation. UDCA is a bile acid which affects a reduction in cholesterol and bowel biliary fluid primarily by dispersing the cholesterol and forming a liquid crystal phase. Okay, pregnancy. There are no or limited amounts of data from the use of UDCA in pregnant women. Studies in animals have shown reproductive toxicity to, during the early phase of gestation. Also, the oxycholic acid capsules must not be used during pregnancy unless clearly necessary. Hmm. Breastfeeding. Women of childbearing potential. Women of childbearing potential should be treated only if they use reliable contraception. Possibly, a pregnancy must be excluded before beginning treatment. Breastfeeding. According to few documented cases of breastfeeding women, milk levels of UDCA are very low and probably no adverse reactions are to be expected in breastfed infants. Okay, okay for breastfeeding, UDCA. But it sounds like it's not really very, very safe in pregnancy as well. Oh well, let's look at our, what RCOG guidelines say because like lots of uh, really high posting obstetricians or gynecologists have um, come up with a consensus after weighing the risk versus benefit. RCOG is for or cholestasis. Eh. And the guidelines. No, it's not. Okay. 
So is there a summary at the end? No, it doesn't look like it. Just suggested all the topics. Okay, then we'll read through the recommendations in the front, I guess. How is obstetric cholestasis diagnosed? Obstetric cholestasis is diagnosed when otherwise unexplained pruritus occurs in pregnancy and abnormal liver function tests and or raised bowel acids occur in the pregnant woman and both resolve after delivery. Pruritus that involves the palms and soles of the feet is particularly subjective, suggestive. Pregnancies of specific reference ranges for LFD should be used. Other causes of itching and or liver dysfunction should be excluded. Women with persistent pruritus and normal biochemistry should have LFDs repeated every one to two weeks. Postnatal reduction resolution of pruritus and abnormal LFDs should be confirmed. How should obstetric cholestasis be monitored? Once obstetric cholestasis is diagnosed, it is reasonable to measure LFDs weekly until delivery. Postnatally, LFD should be deferred for at least 10 days. What is the risk of stillbirth for pregnancy is complicated by obstetric cholestasis? In a hospital setting, the current additional risk of stillbirth in obstetric cholestasis above that of the general population has not been determined, but it's likely to be small. Small risk. Of stillbirth. What additional risk are associated with pregnancy is complicated by obstetric cholestasis? Obstetricians should be aware and should advise women that the incidence of premature birth, especially iatrogenic, is increased. Women should be advised of the increased likelihood of meconium passage in pregnancies affected by obstetric cholestasis. Women with obstetric cholestasis should be booked in under consultant-led team-based care and give birth in hospital unit. Can fetal death be predicted and prevented? Poor outcome cannot currently be predicted by bio biochemical results and delivery decisions should not be based on results alone. No specific methods of antenatal fetal monitoring for the prediction of fetal death can be recommended. Ultrasound and cardiocardiogram Cardiotocography are not reliable methods for preventing fetal death in obstetric cholestasis. Continuous fetal monitoring in labor should be offered. Should women with obstetric cholestasis be offered elective early delivery? A discussion should take place with should take place with women regarding induction of labor after 37 weeks of gestation. Women should be informed of the increased risk of perinatal morbidity from early intervention after 37 weeks of gestation. Women should be informed that the case for intervention after 37 weeks of gestation may be stronger in those with more severe biochemical uh, abnormalities, for example, transaminases and bowel acids. For women, women should be informed of the increased risk of maternal morbidity from intervention at 37 weeks of gestation, women should be informed of the ability to predict stillbirth if the pregnancy continues. Uh, the inability to predict stillbirth if the pregnancy continues. What treatment, if any, should be used to treat obstetric cholestasis and what benefit can be expected? There is no evidence that any specific treatment improves fetal or neonatal outcomes. All such therapies should be discussed with an individual woman with this in mind. Topical emollients. Topical emollients are safe but their efficacy is unknown. Systemic treatment. Cholesteramine. Uh, what's this again? It's a bowel acid sequestration in the intestines, right? Poorly tolerated bowel acid-chelating agent, which may improve pruritus in some women, but may also exacerbate vitamin K deficiency. Yeah, because ADEK K is one of the fat-soluble vitamins. So if you uh, prevent reabsorption, uh, absorption or reabsorption of bowel, you will have uh, problems with uh, fat-soluble vitamins. You will have fat-soluble vitamin deficiency, which include vitamin K deficiency, which have been associated with fetal intracranial hemorrhage. Cholestyramine has not been subjected to randomized trials and is not in clinical use. 
Antihistamines such as chlorphenamine may provide some welcome sedation at night but do not have a significant impact on pruritus. Activated charcoal and guar gum do not relieve pruritus. What's this? S adenosyl methionine. There's insufficient evidence to demonstrate whether S adenosyl methionine is effective for either control of maternal symptoms or for improving fetal outcome and is not recommended. Also, the oxycalic acid. UDCA improves pruritus and liver function in women with osteotric cholestasis. Women should be informed of the lack of robust data concerning protection against stillbirth and safety of the fetus or neonate. Dexamethasone. Dexamethasone should not be first-line therapy for treatment of obstetric cholestasis, nor should it be used outside of a randomized control trial without thorough consultation with the woman. What's the role of vitamin K? A discussion should take place with the woman regarding the use of vitamin K. Women should be advised that where prothrombin time is prolonged, the use of water-soluble vitamin K, menadiol, sodium phosphate in doses of 5 to 10 mg daily is indicated. Women should be advised that when prothrombin time is normal, water-soluble vitamin K, menadiol, sodium phosphate in low doses should be used only after careful counseling about the likely benefits versus small theoretical risk. But small theoretical risk. What's a small theoretical risk? Hmm. What follow-up should be offered to women who have had a pregnancy affected by obstetric cholestasis? Women should be offered follow-up with healthcare professional with necessary skills and expertise to provide appropriate counselling and to ensure that LFTs have returned to normal. Future research. Okay, although from past med, we learned that the increased risk of stillbirth, so you want to induce labour at 37 weeks. However, According to the guidelines, studies, they, do, they did recommend that you can consider the, the uh, induction of labor at 37 weeks. There's a very slight, very slight increased risk of uh, stillbirth if you don't do it. But you have to tell them about the risk of uh, intervention as well. Like if you induce... Um, Mm, there is a higher risk of uh, uh, not enough fetal lung maturation, things like that. But 37 weeks should be fine. Hmm. Alright. Basically, no, no treatment is also okay uh, for this. Wait, let's read about the vitamin K supplementation. Where's the risk on stillbirth? In hospital setting, the current additional risk of stillbirth in obstetric cholestasis above that of the general population has not been determined. It's likely to be small. It's not been determined it's likely to be small. More research has to be done on that. Mm. And then, uh, elective early delivery, you should discuss and inform them of the risk versus benefit. Benefit is that um, there's a potential, but not proven, small risk of... Uh, the baby being stillbirth means born, not alive. Mm. So if you deliver early, uh, then that's a decrease of that potential unproven risk. Sounds weird. Okay. So that's why you have to discuss with the woman and see what she wants. And, and tell them about the risk of uh, doing the induction of labor as well.
and then it will be more justified to do an induction of labor if the labor function are more deranged. You can't predict stillbirth if the pregnancy continues. Inability to predict. And what, what was that that I want to read about again? Can't remember. Let me scroll through and see if I come across it. Vitamin K, yeah, I want to read a bit about vitamin K. Why vitamin K is useful? As vitamin K is fat soluble, women have fat mild absorption, especially biliary obstruction or hepatic disease. Ah, okay. May become deficient in vitamin K. For oral administration to prevent vitamin K deficiency and mild absorption syndromes or water soluble preparation, menadiol sodium phosphate must be used with a usual dose of 10 mg daily. However, the British National Formulary advises avoiding therapy in late pregnancy and labor because of a risk of neonatal hemolytic anemia. That's a theoretical risk, huh? BNF advises avoiding therapy in late pregnancy and labor because of risk of neonatal hemolytic anemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and chronicters. Local difficulties with implementing the previous versions of this guideline in light of this advice has necessitated a revision of this version of the guideline. The evidence for the advice in the BNF appears largely historical. The first of several case reports of connectorous and hemolytic anemia following large doses of water-soluble vitamin K analogs given to premature babies 30 mg and apparently and par parentally to the woman in labor 72 mg to prevent hemolytic disease of the newborn was published in 1955. Little detail is available and the vitamin K absor and absorption status of the mothers is not known. One author in a field concluded at the time that no toxic effect would be anticipated following small adequate clinical doses, 5 mg or 1 to 2 mg to the newborn. Although the data to support the antenatal use of vitamin K in obstetric cholestasis is sparse, there are good physiological reasons why this treatment may be beneficial. Obstetric cholestasis can result in reduced absorption of dietary fats owing to failure of excretion of bowel salts into the gastrointestinal tract and reduced micelle formation. Increased fat excretion in women with obstetric cholestasis may be subclinical but, but demonstrable on, on fecal fat assay or clinically apparent as steroturia. And both have been reported to affect the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins including vitamin K, which is required for the manufacture of coagulation factors uh, 1972 2, 7, 9, and 10. Water soluble um, vitamin K has been prescribed widely in the management of obstetric cholestasis. cholestasis. The usual dose is 10 mg daily by mouth, aiming to improve both maternal and neonatal levels, which are assumed to be deficient and therefore reduce postpartum hemorrhage and fetal or neonatal bleeding. Postnatal vitamin K must be offered to the babies in the usual way. Prothrombin time is rarely reported, but one of the series in one series, four of fifty women, eight percent had abnormal times that were corrected by parenteral vitamin K dose and frequency of administration not stated. Kenyon et al. found that postpartum hemorrhage was more common in those women who had not taken vitamin K compared to those who had. 45% compared with 12%. There have been no randomized control trials in this area. Data from pregnant women taking anti-epileptic medications who are at risk of vitamin K deficiency because of liver enzyme induction show greater levels of vitamin K in the offspring of those who took oral supplements before delivery compared with offspring of those who do not. Okay, so vitamin K is definitely good. It's just that some old studies, very old, old studies that show that, uh, what did they show actually? There's an increased risk of hemolysis in the newborn, in the hemolytic anemia in the newborn. That's very old studies and very high doses. Hmm. Okay, I'll give vitamin K induction, yes or no, controversial, you have to discuss with the parent. Right, next question. 
A 62-year-old woman is admitted to the hospital with symptoms of fluid overload. She has pitting edema up to her mid thigh, wow, quite high, which has developed over the course of a week. She is otherwise asymptomatic. Also of note, she is known to be HIV positive and a previous heroin addict, but is currently receiving antiretroviral therapy, is on the methadone program, and is receiving help from addiction services. A urine sample is seen to be foamy and shows 3 plus protein, sounds nephrotic in nature. And the urine dates on a urine stick, but no other abnormalities are noted. A blood test is done and the results are below. Sodium is normal on the lower end of normal. Potassium is low. Bicarbonate is normal. Urea is slightly high. Threatening is very high. And albumin is low. What's the most likely diagnosis? Mm. What is the most likely diagnosis? Let's look at each of these one by one. Focal segmental glomerulonephritis. FSGS. There is no hematuria, so the uh, the fact that this is termed glomerulonephritis. Nephritic syndrome. I'm guessing, based on the name, that is more nephritic than nephrotic. It should be blood in the urine, but there's no blood in the urine. So I guess that's less pos possible. Possible, but less probable. IgA nephropathy. Why would there be IgA nephropathy? In somebody with HIV? Is there a pathophysiological explanation? Mm, how about receiving HRT? Or how about methadone program? Nah, I don't know. Minimal change. Minimal change is the most common in pediatrics. In adults, I don't know in adults. Uh, let's see the blood results. Huh? There's low potassium. Why is there low potassium? Mm. You know what? It's really hard to guess. No more change, membrane proliferative membranous. I think you just either know or you don't know, honestly. There is some kidney damage, creatinine is high. So. Maybe not just minimal change, something more serious than minimal change. Um, albumin is low. Help, hypoalbuminemia is a feature of nephrotic syndrome. However, high creatinine, I don't know. It's just uh, if the minimal change disease, right? It's just a uh, um, it lost the. Podocyte food, there's just like slight effacement of the podocyte food processes, which causes it to lose the negative charge and then it causes like uh, medium sized proteins to leak through. It doesn't really uh, affect your GFR that much, so creatinine shouldn't be that risk in minimal change, I think. Just thinking. So, maybe something more than minimal change. The membrane proliferative? Was it membranous? I'm gonna go with membrane, it's got some small benign that membrane are probably afraid of, but it's just guessing at this point. The answer is FSGS. Okay, so HIV infection is a cause of focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Okay. This woman presents with a picture of nephrotic syndrome with the characteristic triad of edema, proteinuria, and hypoalbuminemia. The foamy urine is due to lipiduria and the elevated creatinine and urea are due to renal dysfunction. Focal segmental glomerulonephritis is the most likely cause of a nephrotic syndrome due to the past medical history. HIV and heroin misuse are two independent risk factors for the development of the disease. While it is normally, while it normally presents in young adults, the risk factors here make this diagnosis more likely. IgA nephropathy more commonly presents with nephritic picture, i.e. hematuria, 
with less than 10% of cases presenting with nephrotic symptoms. Minimal change disease is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. However, the age of this patient and associated risk factors make focal segmental glomerular nephritis more likely. Membranal proliferative glomerular nephritis is less common cause of nephrotic syndrome in both children and adults and is not the most likely given the clinical scenario. And membranous nephropathy is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults. However, the risk factors here point more towards focal segmental glomerular nephritis despite her age. And here are some notes on focal segmental, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Glomerular sclerosis or glomerular nephritis. Same, I guess, interchangeable. Focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, FSGS, is, um, is a cause of nephrotic syndrome and chronic kidney disease. It generally presents in young adults. Causes are idiopathic, secondary to other renal pathology, for example, IgA nephropathy, reflux nephropathy, or HIV, heroin, Alport syndrome, sickle cell. Focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is noted for having a high recurrence rate in renal transplants. Investigations include renal biopsy, focal and segmental sclerosis and hyalinosis on light microscopy, effacement of food processes on electron microscopy. Management steroids plus immunosuppressants. Uh, prognosis untreated FSGS has a less than 10 chance, 10 percent chance of spontaneous remission. Sclerosis of glomerulus next to the bone seen next to the Bowman capsule. This is the Bowman's capsule. Yes. This is the glomerulus. Sclerosis. Sclerosis. Thick pink part is sclerosis. Very high level region of glomerulus. All right, let's look at the uh, explanation of the pathophysiology of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Then maybe we'll understand why it's more common in heroin abusers and HIV patients and sickle cell.
Uh, they mention HIV, they mention sickle cell, they mention heroin, but they didn't mention how it causes it. Deposition of proteins. So in HIV, probably you have viral proteins deposit there. In sickle cell disease, what kind of proteins do you have deposited there? Sickle cell, you have a hemolysis, probably a broken down red blood cell proteins. How about heroin abuse? Don't know. Done. Okay, now my this uh, try and commit to memory FSGS more common HIV heroin abuse and sickle cell disease. Okay, next question. Hey, wait, let me search whether I have this. Or not. Okay, next question. A 75 year old male patient presents with a feeling of weakness of the legs. On the examination, there are also some skin changes present with purple plaque, purple plaques on the dorsum of the hands. Weakness in the legs. 75 year old male weakness in the legs, both legs set. On the examination, there are also some skin changes present with purple plaques on the dorsum of the hands. Purple plaques plus on the hands. You suspect a diagnosis of dermatomyositis. Is it called Trump Papules, is it? Which of the following underlying conditions is associated with dermatomyositis and should be considered? Usually it's um, abdominal cancer, right? Liver cirrhosis, chronic renal failure, hematochromatosis, internal malignancy. It's internal malignancy. Yep. Dermatomyositis is usually an autoimmune condition being most common in women aged 50 to 70. However, it can also be perineoplastic disease with ovarian, breast, and lung tumors being the most common underlying cancers, ovarian, breast, and lung tumors. The possibility of underlying malignancy should be considered especially in older patients. Some notes on dermatomyositis. Overview, an inflammatory disorder causing symmetrical proximal muscle weakness and characteristic skin lesions may be idiopathic or associated with connective tissue disorders or underlying malignancy, typically ovarian breast and lung cancer, found in 20 to 25% more in patient, if patient is older. Uh, screening for an underlying malignancy is usually performed following a diagnosis of dermatomyositis. Polymyositis is a variant of the disease where skin manifestations is not prominent. Skin features include photosensitivity, macular rash over the back and shoulder, you call this a shawl sign, heliotrope rash on the periorbital region, purple color rash, named after a flower, gotrum papules on your knuckles, roughened red papules over extensive surfaces of fingers, mechanic hand, extremely dry and scaly hands with linear cracks on the palmar and lateral aspects of the fingers, nail fold capillary dilatation, Mm, this this um common in systemic sclerosis as well. I'm not sure what's the pathophysiology of that. Maybe a hypoperfusion of your or damage to your vessels. I think hypoperfusion of your vessels. Probably caused by co-agglutinins or something like that. Other features, proximal muscle weakness, tenderness, uh, Reinhardt's phenomenon. Yeah, so you have Reinhardt's here as well. So that probably explains the nail full capillary dilatation. Um, respiratory muscle weakness, interstitial lung disease, for example, fibrosing, alveolitis, organizing pneumonia, uh, dysphagia, dysphonia. Investigations, the majority of patients, around 80% are ANA positive. Around 30% of patients have antibodies to amino acyl tRNA synthetase and T-synthetase antibodies, including antibodies against histidine tRNA ligase, also called JO1, antibodies to signal recognition particle, SRP, and the Me2 antibodies. Okay. 
don't think some of this will tell you about the prognosis can't remember exactly which one is good and which one is bad prognosis right next question an eight-year-old child is brought into the emergency department after having five episodes of bloody diarrhea oh, is this inflammatory bowel disease her parents say that the diarrhea began three days ago okay three days is more acute sounds more like a what do you call that dysentery after a barbecue at a friend's house, but it did not turn bloody until today. On examination, the child is pyrexial and 38 degrees with diffuse abdominal pain. Blood tests are taken which show thrombocytopenia, raised urea, thrombocytopenia, raised urea, creatinine, and lactate dehydrogenase. Which of the following organisms are most likely caused is infection? So I try and tell me about an organism based on the lab findings so try and think about it thrombocytopenia means there's a little bit of platelets it's reduced platelets race urea means there's some renal impairment involved is it hemolytic uremic syndrome hus caused by e coli 0157 yeah hemolytic uremic syndrome usually has impairments of the renal function creatinine and lactate dehydrogenase creatinine is an, again a, a, a marker of renal renal impairment um, lactate dehydrogenase just means lots of uh, cells are being broken down it's contained in your red blood cells as well so probably that's hemolysis due to the hemolytic uremic syndrome it's thrombocytopenia though thrombocytopenia I'm guessing E. coli 0157 strain however because the, the rest I don't know um, that it causes uh, lab findings like these Giardia is literally traveler's diarrhea there's no travel history norovirus is a viral infection should be not so serious shouldn't have so much of a dysentery more like a watery diarrhea listeria is uh i don't know how listeria presents actually how does it present i don't know can pylobacter is another cause of uh painful diarrhea Hmm. No, Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, I think, will cause bloody diarrhea, but not known to cause a renal impairment, right? So E. coli, la, 0157, that's the only one that theoretically causes all these derangements. All of the answer given could be a possible cause of food poisoning. However, in this case, the child is not just showing signs of food poisoning, but also early signs of hemolytic uremic syndrome. This can be seen by the diarrhea, which becomes bloody one to three days after its onset, along with blood results, hemolysis, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and raised lactate dehydrogenase. Urea and creatinine all point towards hemolytic and uremic syndrome in this case. Whilst there are many different bacteria that cause hemolytic uremic syndrome, E. coli strain 0157 H7 is the most common. It is not the bacteria itself, but instead a Shiga toxin that causes the problems, and it's believed that a bacterial phage was responsible for transferring the genus the genes to E. coli, which enable it to produce the highly toxic Shiga toxin. Let's look at zero to finals videos on hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, let's read this first. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, hemolytic uremic syndrome is generally seen in young children and produces a triad of acute kidney injury, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Most cases are secondary term, typical HUS. Classically, Shiga toxin producing E. coli. This is the most common cause in children, accounting for over 90% of cases. Pneumococcal infection, HIV can also cause it. Rare in SLE, drugs, cancer. Primary HUS, atypical, is due to complement 
dysregulation. Investigations to do include full blood count, looking for anemia, thrombocytopenia, and fragmented blood film, UNAs, acute kidney injury, stool culture, looking for evidence of STEC infection, PCR for shiga toxins. STEC stands for shiga toxin producing E. coli. And management. Treatment is supportive, for example, fluids, blood transfusion, and dialysis if required. There is no role for antibiotics despite the preceding diarrheal illness in many patients. The indications for plasma exchange in HUS are complicated. As a general rule, plasma exchange is reserved for severe cases of HUS not associated with diarrhea. Eculizumab. C5 inhibitor monoclonal antibody has evidence of greater efficacy than plasma exchange alone in the treatment of adult atypical HUS. So usually it's supportive management of fluid drug blood transfusion dialysis if required. Okay, let's look at uh, zero to finals first. I, I, I watched this video before, it's very useful. Oh, you can't hear this, can you?
Sorry, I didn't do this earlier. Talking to you about notes on the S as H U S occurs when there's thrombosis in the small blood vessels throughout the body. Remember, thrombosis is blood clots. So this is where little blood clots occur within the small blood vessels throughout the body. This is usually triggered by a bacterial toxin called the sugar toxin. And it leads to a classic triad of hemolytic anemia. So this is anemia caused by the breakdown of red blood cells, acute kidney injury, and a low platelet count, which is described as thrombocytopenia. The most common cause is a toxin produced by the bacteria E. coli 0157, which is called the sugar toxin. And five, the most common cause is thrombocytopenia. The most common cause is a toxin produced by the bacteria E. coli 0157, which is called the sugar toxin. A different bug called Shigella also produces this same toxin. And the use of antibiotics and anti-motility medications like loperamide to treat gastroenteritis caused by these particular pathogens increases the risk of developing hemolytic uremic syndrome. So this is the main reason when somebody has gastroenteritis that we wouldn't routinely use antibiotics or loperamide to treat the condition. So how does it present? Well, E. coli 0157 causes a brief gastroenteritis, often with bloody diarrhea. And about five days after the diarrhea, the person will start displaying symptoms of hemolytic uremic syndrome. And these are things like reduced urine output because of the acute kidney injury, hematuria or dark brown urine, abdominal pain, lethargy and irritability, confusion, hypertension or high blood pressure, and also bruising. So how do we manage the condition? Well, hemolytic uremic syndrome is a medical emergency and it's got a very high mortality rate of about 10%. The condition is self-limiting, so treatment is with supportive management, and this is with antihypertensive medications to keep the blood pressure in the normal range, blood transfusions if required to treat the hemolytic anemia, and hemodialysis if there's a severe acute kidney injury. Around 70 to 80% of patients who develop hemolytic uremic syndrome will make a complete recovery. Thank you for watching this video. Don't talk about the pathophysiology at all. Right, next question. A 37 year old man with schizophrenia has been on clozapine for five years and has been well controlled and stable for that time. However, at his most recent checkup, the clozapine levels were found to be above the recommended range and his dose is therefore reduced, which are feeling most likely to cause the free rising clozapine in blood levels. Um, clozapine. Alcohol abstinence, maybe? Talking about probably CYP450 enzyme inhibition and induction. So in this case, clozapine levels increase. So yeah, you either stop induction or you uh, cause inhibition of the CYP450. So oh, if you omit doses, the level should reduce, right? So I guess that's out smoking cessation. I don't know if smoking affects clozapine levels directly, but it doesn't affect CYP450 enzymes, I think. Stress also doesn't affect CYP450 enzymes. Weight gain also doesn't affect CYP450 enzymes. Probably. So the only answer left is alcohol abstinence. Let's think about this carefully. So alcohol, you drink alcohol. You would use up your liver enzymes, right? Chronic alcoholism actually is a CYP450 enzyme inducer. So you stop taking alcohol. Should alcohol function, uh, liver function should increase more. So it should cause cause up levels to drop. I don't know, man. This is doesn't sound like a CYP450 thing. Mm. What causes the rising close up in blood levels? Mm. Which level is the absorption happening? I don't know eh. Clozapine can cause weight gain. It wasn't, wasn't in fact drug levels. Smoking cessation probably improve your 
gastric function. Just gonna tembak here. Oh, correct all. Smoking cessation can cause a rise in cause of pain blood levels. Smoking cessation can cause a significant rise in cause of pain levels, and so it should be discussed with a psychiatrist before stopping smoking. Starting smoking or smoking more can reduce cause of pain levels. Stopping drinking can also reduce levels, as uh, alcohol binges can increase the level. Omitting doses will cause a reduction in cause of pain levels, and stress and weight gain won't have significant effects on the level. Atypical antipsychotics. Clozapine. Smoking. The only for clozapine though. Strange, huh? Is the tar in cigarettes which affect close up in metabolism, not nicotine? How? No, not tar. Is that website is not reliable? Clozapine is metabolized by CYP1A2 and CYP3A4 and partially also by cytochrome P450 2C19, CYP 2C19. Inducers of these enzymes decrease and, inhib and inhibitors increase PC. PC is what? What is PC? Plasma concentration, okay. So it is a CYP450 enzyme. Mm. Inducers decrease and inhibitors increase Plasma concentration, polycyclic cyclic aromatic um, aromatic hydrocarbons in cigarettes are inducers of CYP1A2. Therefore, smokers need higher doses of clozapine to reach recommended clozapine PC levels than non-smokers do. A considerable number of studies have examined. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, that's the culprit, induce CYP1A2. Okay, so it's related to CYP. Smokers induce CYP. Okay, and the last question. 78-year-old female presents to emergency department after fainting at home with a background of 3-day history of diarrhea and abdominal pain. She has a past medical history of type 2 diabetes mellitus and dyspepsia and is currently taking ciprofloxacin for moderate infection in a diabetic foot ulcer and amaprazole. Her observations show a respiratory rate of 22 breaths per minute, pulse rate of 123 beats per minute. Let me read again. 78 year old female presents to the ED after fainting at home with a background of 3-day history of diarrhea and abdominal pain. She has a past medical history of type 2 DM and dyspepsia. Dyspepsia is abdominal discomfort and is uh, currently taking ciprofloxacin for a moderate infection in the diabetic foot ulcer and omeprazole. Ciprofloxacin is a fluoroquinolone, right? Omeprazole is a PPI. Observation show respiratory rate. She has diarrhea and abdominal pain. Hmm, is this CD for? Her observations show a respiratory of 22 breaths per minute, 
high, tachypnea, pulse rate 123, tachycardia and a fever 38.1 degrees Celsius, blood pressure is low, 80 over 62, she's in shock and oxygen, oxygen saturation is 96 on room, still okay. As part of panel investigation, the stool sample is taken which returns a positive result for C. diff toxin. And an abnormal radiograph shows a large bowel distension diameter more than 5.5 cm. Is this toxic megacolon yet? Large bowel distension. More than 6 cm is considered as dilation. But this is more than 5.5. Which of the following is the most appropriate antibiotic prescribing strategy for this patient? How sick is she? Very sick. So she needs oral vancomycin. Stop ciprofloxacin, commence oral vancomycin and IV metronidazole. Yep. In life threatening C. diff, infection treatment is with oral vancomycin and IV metronidazole. The correct answer is stop ciprofloxacin and commence on vanc oral vanc vancomycin and IV metronidazole. Combination of this patient's medication, ciprofloxacin and meprazole, are high risk for C. diff or ciprofloxacin as well. Hmm. It's a fluoroquinone one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's a fluoroquinone one. It's rare, less than 1 in 1,000, more than 1 in 10,000, less than 1 in 1,000, look at. The combination of this patient's medication, ciprofloxacin and omeprazole are high risk for C. diff. Hey, wait, let me compare with uh, cephalosporin. So, what are the cephalosporins that I know? Ceftriaxone. Hmm. And then, pseudomembranous colitis. It's also rare. How about cefotexim, cefiroxim? Cephotexim is a mm -mm, cephalosporin is a third generation. Higher. Not known. A. Cephalosporins. Mm, I guess they all have a uh, similar risk. Not very common, but it's a possible thing. Mm. See, uh, the combination of these patients' medications, ciprofloxacin and meprazole, are high risk of C. diff, and her positive CDT stool sample made a diagnosis of current clostridium difficile infection likely. As this patient is profoundly hypotensive and has radiologic evidence of toxic megacolon, this is a life threatening infection. Really? Toxic megacolon more than 5.5 cm. That's a large bowel, you know. I thought the threshold is 6 cm. 3 cm for small bowel, 6 cm for large bowel, 9 cm for cecum, I think. So a life-threatening infection. Correct antibiotic prescribing in these cases includes commencing oral vancomycin and IV metronidazole. Let me just uh, get this over with toxic. Yeah. Toxic megacolon. Acute complication, memory bowel disease, less common infectious colitis, 
other types of colitis due to fulminant colitis causes loss of neurologic tone on the colon leading to severe dilatation, increasing the risk of perforation. Pathology mechanisms involve development of toxic megacolon not entirely clear, although chemical mediators such as nitric oxide and interleukins are thought to play a pivotal role in the pathogenesis. Patients are typically systemically ill with diarrhea. Etiology ulcerative colitis most common cause. Less common causes include Crohn's disease, ischemic colitis, gastrointestinal graft versus host disease, C. diff, hypothyroidism. Radiographic features, plain radiograph, the colon typically transverse colon becomes dilated to at least 6 cm. See the 369 rule. Signs of pneumoperitoneum that may be present if dilatation is progressed to perforation. Dilatation increases in serial imaging. On CT, there is additional loss of hostile markings with pseudopolyps often extending in the lumen due to ulceration of colony wall, thumb printing, and periodic fat stranding from mucosal edema may be present indicating colonic wall thickening. 369 rule of the bowel. 369 rule simple aid memoir describing the normal bowel caliber. Small bowel with less than 3 cm, large bowel less than 6 cm, appendix is less than 6 mm and cecum is less than 9 cm. Above these dimensions, the bowel is generally considered dilated and obstruction or an adynamic ileus should be considered. So in this case, only 5.5, not really toxic megacolon. Lah. Hypotensive and radiographic evidence of toxic megacolon. This is a life-threatening infection. Correct antibiotic prescribing in these cases includes commencing oral vancomycin and IV metronidazole and stopping any other antibiotics in this case ciprofloxacin because please note a positive CDT stool has poor positive predictive value as it only shows exposure. C diff toxin really rather than current infection no leh. CDF toxin shows current infection, isn't it? CDT diagnosis is made by detecting CDT in the stool. CD antigen positivity only shows exposure to bacteria rather than current infection. Toxin is current infection. Why wow. this explanation? So many flaws. Huh? Hmm. Continue ciprofloxacin and commence oral vancomycin and IV metronidazole is incorrect as uh, ciprofloxacin should be stopped. Stop ciprofloxacin and commence IV vancomycin IV metronidazole is incorrect as vancomycin should be given orally. Stop ciprofloxacin and commence oral vancomycin is incorrect as this is the management of severe not life-threatening CD. And stop ciprofloxacin and comments oral vancomycin oral metronidazole incorrect metronidazole should be given IV in life threatening infections. Severe oral vancomycin may be used. Life threatening oral vancomycin IV metronidazole. Okay, mm, that's ten questions. See you in the next one. Sorry for the audio.